this is the time that uh, we are going to be deliberating on to zero trust, ladies and gentlemen. How do you simplify your journey with Trend Micro? Well, uh, we're going to be inviting the solutions architect from Trend Micro to be joining us. Bhavan Gandhi, can we request you to take up the stage? Please welcome Mr. Gandhi with number one round of Shah Rukh Khan with Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much, Shikha. Good afternoon, everyone. So, how was the lunch? Good. Good. Just one person. Come on, everyone. How was the lunch? Good, enjoyed, wonderful, awesome, awesome. So uh, my topic for today is going to be uh, zero trust. Uh, how many of you are aware of uh, zero trust or have already implemented zero trust? And wonderful, good, 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 good. Uh, good show of hands, right? So uh, <clears throat> let me start with the basics. Uh, so when we talk to our customers, right, so what we hear from them is that they want a better visibility in their organization. Uh, they want to see what is happening across their infrastructure. Uh, at the same time, they want to keep the potential risks as low as possible, right? There is nothing like zero risk. There is going to be a risk, but you want to minimize that as much as possible. What also happens is that along with that, they want to keep the attackers out, right? Risk is one aspect. When we talk about attackers, right, they want to ensure that the number of attackers which target their organization, their infrastructure, is also at the minimal, right? So when we talk to customers, on the one hand, they want to have the best of technology, they want to enhance the technology in their environment, keeping their business needs in mind, and at the same time, on the other hand, they want to ensure that they are compliant. Right? Regulations. They want to ensure that they are in that space of compliance and regulatory requirements which are set in their environment by various different regulatory authorities. And that is where uh, they want a partner like Trend Micro to put that effort to help them deploy solutions and technologies which help them achieve uh, various different things, zero trust being just one of them. Right? Uh, why is zero trust become such a necessity for a lot of organizations these days, right? Uh, reasons are people working from various different places. We've heard this a lot, right? Post-COVID, for sure, office, airport, homes. But what has also changed is the way people work from coffee shops now, right? I have, if I, I could do this, cabin in the woods, right? I had a friend, I have a friend rather, who used to do it in Canada back in COVID days, right? Fortunate, right? You work in a cabin somewhere, you just upload, connect to your infrastructure. So you're pushing the limits of your VPN uh, infra to the max, right? You want to connect to your corporate infrastructure from wherever you are, right? And more, right? These are just some of the examples from where users work nowadays. To add to it, you have your sensitive data everywhere. The reason being, because people are using multiple different tools, right? So it is not only limited to what the corporate gives them to use. As an individual, uh, we use a lot of other tools which may not be sanctioned, or we tend to access certain websites or certain tools which are available online, right? Just because we have internet access, everybody does that. So that is also expanding. Now, when we merge both of it, where you have access to sensitive data, and you as a user are not in the corporate environment all the time, it is going to stress out, right? And that is where zero trust is the need of the R, right? So just to level set, I wanted to bring up a couple of points, right? What zero trust is and what zero trust isn't, right? So let me start with what it isn't. Two points. Zero trust is not a product. When I say it is not a product, you just don't uh, go to a vendor and say, I want to buy zero trust. It doesn't work that way, right? Zero trust is a journey. It's a, it's a, a process, right? It's, it's the way you deploy certain technologies and products in your environment which helps you achieve zero trust, right? So it's not a product. Second is, it can't be achieved overnight because, like I said, it's a process. Uh, you refine it, you learn from uh, you learn from your mistakes once you deploy it, and then keep fine-tuning it to suit your environment and your organization. So a, a zero-trust journey will vary from an organization to organization. So if we want to say that, okay, this is my competitor in the industry, and I want to just replicate their zero-trust journey, it will never happen, right? So what zero-trust is, is it's an information security model, 
right? Uh, there are some basic guidelines which are available. I have a slide which I'll show you on that. Uh, it is a shift from the implicit trust, right? So the moment we moved into the COVID phase, everybody wanted access to information, data, whatever they were used to running in their offices. So now you never trust, you always verify. This is a term most of us have heard in the past couple of years. Uh, to add to it, zero trust is to deny access by default. Right? That is one of the key criteria when you adopt or when you deploy or when you choose to uh, take zero trust as a journey in your organization. And the access decisions are formed based on various different parameters and risk being one of the most critical parameters when it comes to adopting, deploying zero trust in the environment. I'll, I'll come to that as well, why risk is important. Right? So it is about users, it is about devices, it is about workloads. So when I say workloads, it could be workloads on-premise, your critical servers, databases, or it could be workloads in a public cloud environment as well, just like Azure or AWS or a Google Cloud. Right? So you need to have a complete visibility of your entire infrastructure. That is where and when you will be able to apply uh, attack surface. You must have heard of that terminology as well, and zero trust. And they work in hand in hand, right? So it is a couple of things uh, which work hand in hand. I'll come to that as well. So this is the NIST 800-207 model. This is like an architecture based on which uh, organizations or vendors have designed their zero trust. Or customers can adopt this as a baseline as well, that this is how my zero trust architecture should look like. Now, a lot of things a lot of components, right? So not necessarily you need to have everything in your environment, right? It could be a technology which can cater to multiple different parameters. It could be a one single technology catering to one particular parameter and multiple different technologies. So it can be both ways, right? Next up is when we have this architecture, when we have the NIST document to refer to, which becomes like a guideline as a baseline to where to start from and how to start from, you also have five different principles or uh, publicly defined ways of uh, bringing in zero trust in an environment. So the first is to provide protection to these five pillars here. So they are data, your identity, workload again, your servers, the critical assets, right? Your network plays a very important role because it's not only limited to your on-prem data center, everybody knows that, right? And application, it resides with the workload, your databases, and everything put together, right? So you need to consider these five pillars first and the pointers which are to follow. So you protect these five pillars. You get the relevant information from these different five pillars when it comes to for endpoints. It can't be just an anti-malware which is residing on your endpoint and it's going to give you everything. No, you need to have telemetry information as just one of the pointers which needs to come into your platform. Right? Uh, when it comes to workload, I can't just say that, okay, it's there, somebody's protecting it, it's working as a service. No, you need to ensure that you have, you have the right controls on it. As simple as having, uh, say, an integrity monitoring, some malicious changes which are happening, how do you ensure that you are aware of it? It is not an authorized change, but it's a change which has happened because the server is infected or being targeted. Right? So various different modules within your security controls on your workloads are also equally important. Automating the security measures, right? So you can't be doing everything and anything manually, right? A lot of automation is required in terms of uh, protecting your environment. As simple as if I have center information on my centralized console, how do I respond to it? How do I automate the process of it taking action? Anti-malware, for example, automatically takes action, it quarantines, it deletes the file, right? Everybody knows that. But then when I have certain telemetry which is flowing in, how do I respond to it based on the intelligence which has been captured from that server or an endpoint? That is what I mean by automating security. Uh, next is implementing the static and dynamic rules. Now, these are the rules which uh, come from zero trust, right? I need to know how to deploy uh, or automate these rules as well, right? So one is the static aspect of it, not allowing certain things to go in by default, right? Unless I have verified what uh, a person or a particular identity needs to have access to. Identity has become more important than the person himself. Uh, dynamic are more dynamic in nature when it comes to understanding the current risk posture of 
a particular asset, and based on that, you tweak your rules automatically. That is what dynamic rules are, right? And of course, uh, the basic principle of zero trust is least privilege. Uh, when it comes to least privilege, there are multiple different aspects which the NIST model talks about that you don't want to uh, trust, that is one thing, but then what kind of access you want to give. Whether you want to give access to a particular resource only at that moment, and then you withdraw it, and then verify it again, there are various different parameters to it as well, right? Uh, Trend Micro has a centralized threat defense platform, right? So this platform, like I said earlier, it doesn't only cater to zero trust, but it brings in XDR, extended detection and response, attack surface management. We add the R in between for the risk factor, right? So we call it attack surface risk management and zero trust, and much more uh, is available on this platform itself. These are the three core parameters on which this platform works. Uh, we have native sensors in terms of email security, uh, you have endpoint security, you have workload security, you have your network sensors. These native sensors integrate into the Vision One platform. It sends not only the detection logs, but the telemetry, the net flows, everything into this platform for uh, AI, ML, analytics, uh, supervised machine learning, and everything to work on the data which is coming in, and then translate it into legible information for the SOC analyst to look at it, or the security analyst to look at it. All right? Of course, it integrates with global threat intelligence from trend and from third-party sources. It has a huge ecosystem integration with third-party sources, and of course, the platform, the foundation itself, where you have, uh, say, a single sign-on, you have role-based access controls, and on top of it is the overarching layer of zero trust and ASRM, right? So it's a complete attack surface discovery. Attack surface is important because uh, it's important for an organization to know how far and wide their resources have spread, right? Uh, especially with cloud adoption, uh, People who have access to the cloud resources of an organization, they tend to spin up VMs, the instances in the cloud, right? Uh, we use it for testing, then we forget it, we don't switch it off, they're lying there, uh, the user has been given certain privileges, you've given rights to a specific user because he wanted to do some development on that uh, instance, and it's lying there, right? Your firewall rules were compromised because the person wanted complete access to the resource. Many such flaws exist, and we forget, tend to forget about it. That is where your ASRM, the attack surface risk management, comes into play. Right? And it works hand in hand. Like I said, XDR is equally important because it tells you what threats you see in your environment. Based on those threats, you can configure your zero trust configurations and policies that, okay, if this is my uh, uh, security control for this particular server or an endpoint and the risk level has gone high, do I still allow the kind of access that particular resource ident identity or a user had? No, maybe I wanted to bring it down, or maybe I wanted to completely restrict it till the time the posture of that machine goes back to normal, right? Various different parameters. Uh, least privilege, static rules. You have uh, dynamic rules. Nice. Yes. Thank you. Conditional access based on dynamic rules as well. Uh, I just wanted to show you. All right. So again, going back to the NIST model, uh, we've just tried to zoom into the zero trust uh, portion of it within the Vision One platform. And this is how it would look like. I don't want to uh, bore you with more details. We can discuss it offline. But uh, it guides you through your zero trust journey, right? So it pinpoints every entity. When I say entity, it is not only the various departments and uh, various uh, uh, group companies which you manage, but it is those devices which are spread outside of your environment. It helps you to assess every risk. Risk is important, right? It centralizes every action you take, right? So when I say action, it could be a manual action. So on a critical server, you may not want to isolate a server just like that, right? Because it can affect your production completely. So somebody needs to look into that event and then uh, decide on what action to be taken at that given time, right? And uh, finally, you have this 
solution which fits into a customer environment, which suits or which helps a customer uh, go on to that zero trust journey, right? So like I said, it is not a one day thing or a 15 days process. It is an ongoing thing which can be incorporated into a customer's environment. All right, so from the risk perspective, I just wanted to quickly touch upon these five, six important parameters which the threat defense platform Vision One picks up. It is around threat detection. It is around anomaly detection, right? It could be the vulnerabilities. It could be based on the XDR detection wherein the telemetry frozen. It could be, like I said, account compromise, right? So more than a human being like us, it is the identity which is important, right? Nowadays, everything revolves around the identity given to us using our Active Directory or Okta or whatever infra we have in our environment for authentication. And of course, the cloud app activity. Cloud app is not only limited to accessing your public cloud infrastructure, but it is also, uh, uh, it also needs to encompass all other various cloud platforms which the user and the identity accesses. Uh, all right, so apart from that, before I wrap up, uh, we also have a cloud platform, right? We call it the Cloud One. Now, this is helpful for customers who are in the process of moving to the cloud or who have already adopted cloud and you need to protect that infrastructure completely in terms of protecting those instances which are running on Windows, Linux, or a different operating system there. You may want to protect your VPCs, the inter-VM traffic using the network security module. You may want to have visibility of your containers, your DevOps cycles, right? Because the development has uh, gone into a completely different pace at which it happens, right? So all these modules are a part of a Cloud One platform. So you have the Vision One, which gives you XDR, Zero Trust, uh, ASRM, uh, automation uh, of response actions and stuff. And you have the Cloud One platform, which helps you protect your cloud infrastructure. Uh, before I wrap up, I wanted to leave uh, you with these six points here. I picked it up from a Carnegie Mellon research, which was uh, done a couple of uh, months back on zero trust and how it should look like. Agree on generally accepted set of basic, uh, let me just bring it up. All right, so sorry for that. So six different points, agree on generally accepted set of basic zero trust definitions because it's a little vague at the moment when it comes to how do you define zero trust, right? Like I said, which identity, what access, when do I restrict it, when do I give complete access, when do I give access to a particular resource only, various different moving parameters. You have the standard zero trust maturity levels, right? How mature, where does an organization start from? What do I refer to when I want to say that I want to reach here in my zero trust journey? I need to have some baseline to begin with, right? Explain the progress of that maturity level. How am I progressing so that I know as an organization where do I stand and how much time am I going to take? And it supports, it should support distributed architecture and a set of business expectations because having business along with zero trust is the most important piece as well. Uh, that's time up for me, but we'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, we have a booth right outside. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much.